Já está pronto, Rodrigo. Obrigado. Boa tarde, pessoal. Hoje nós temos mais um, uma palestra aqui no nosso ciclo de seminários do PPGE. Hoje nós temos a palestra do professor Mark Costello. Para quem não conhece o professor Mark Costello, Mark é de Kildare, na Irlanda, onde ele se graduou na Universidade Nacional da Irlanda, em Galway, e ele fez seu doutorado na Universidade de Cork, em Cork também, na Irlanda. Depois ele fez um pós-doutorado na Associação de Biologia Marinha de Plymouth, em conjunto com o Laboratório Marinho de Aberdeen e a Universidade de Edinburgh. Após ser professor no Trinity College, em Dublin, por seis anos, o Mark criou seu grupo, sua empresa de consultoria, chamada EcoServe, na qual ele foi diretor. O Mark também foi diretor do Centro de Ciências Marinhas, Huntsman, em St. Andrews, no Canadá, por quase quatro anos, e depois ele se tornou professor na Universidade de Auckland, na Nova Zelândia, e desde 2020 é professor da Nord University. Vou passar para o inglês agora, lembrando que nossa palestra vai ser em inglês. Mark, thank you very much for being here with us. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you here. It will be a great honor to listen to you. So feel free to share your screen, please. So you can all see the slides now, yeah? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce my talk. Um, in New Zealand, the Maori people have a very nice culture where when you meet for the first time, you have to tell somebody where you came from and your origins. So I'll do a little bit of that. It's called a faka papa, which is, sounds cool in English. A lot of Maori words actually sound very cool in English and they've become very trendy. And so thank you very much for this invitation. It's nice to be in Rio de Janeiro this evening, <laughs> virtually. Um, <clears throat> oh, then my slide didn't move, okay. There, it's moved. So one of the things you might have heard um, in the news about 1 million species facing extinction, but actually the IUCN Red List only lists 28,000 species. So how, how, do, how does this add up? How, where do you get 1 million? And is 1 million an important number? Because if you read some of the literature, we see that some people say there's millions, billions, or trillions of species on Earth. So if there's billions of species, well, but one million isn't really very much. It doesn't really matter, does it? But if there's maybe only a few million, then one million is a lot. And many taxonomists have said, well, if there's millions and millions of species and we've only described a small fraction, we can't really help conservation because we can't name things fast enough. <clears throat> so I'm going to criticize that um, based on some databases that we created over the last 10, even 20 years. And some of the things I learned when I was in university, I hope there's some uh, undergraduate students here because after this, you might be able to argue with your professors and a good argument is always a good idea. But what I was told in university was that most species are microscopic, most species were marine, and most species were in the deep sea. And many papers say the number of taxonomists uh, has been decreasing. Some still say all of these things and that marine species richness peaks at the equator. So when I have a live audience, I always ask people to put their hands up about how many people have seen one, two, three, or four of these. So you just have to, I just have to imagine you doing it in the background. And the reason that I believe these things is because my professor said so. But when I go to the literature and then you look at who actually showed this for the first time, you start going back and back and back. And eventually you usually find in the discussion of a paper, somebody made a suggestion and other people like that suggestion. So then it becomes a fact and people then start repeating it. So everybody thinks it must be a fact and somebody else tested the data. But in fact, many things in science, we really haven't tested the data very rigorously. So this is always good fun to do it. And usually you find out that what we think most people think is correct. But now and again, you find out that things aren't quite correct. So in this talk, I will answer those questions at the end and through the talk, and I'll give a little faka papa and talk about how I got into biodiversity informatics uh, by, by accident, and really about biogeography and its applications in relation to extinction rates, marine reserves, and climate change. So this photograph, this bearded guy, here is me when I graduated from Galway University. I grew up near Dublin, Ireland, and then I did my PhD in Loch Ion and Cork, a marine reserve, with some of my friends here. And we also did some field work, which was good fun. And then I moved up to postdocs in Plymouth and in Canada, as, uh, or Scotland, as, as uh, Rodrigo mentioned, and where I met my wife. 
And the thing about meeting somebody from another country is that you end up moving to that country. So after a few years working at Trinity College in Dublin, um, I got a position in Canada. We moved there for a few years. And then we got a more permanent position in New Zealand, where I was for the last 16 years. And since then, I've flown back across up to Arctic Norway, closer to, I guess, our own homelands in Ireland and Scotland. <clears throat> and through this journey, I've had lots of students and undergraduate students and colleagues at work. And teaching does help research, because if you have good students and they ask good questions, then I have to go and find out the answers to these questions. And this often helps me re-explain some of the, the scientific research and improves it. And I remember still back in 1982, I think, um, when um, the late Kieran McCarthy was one of my lecturers, he told me about the theory of island by geography. And I thought, wow, this is amazing because all these patterns we see in nature, they look really chaotic. Um, you know, they, they seem so random or hard to explain, but actually biogeography uh, provides a framework in which we can understand why species are living where they are, how many species exist in different habitats and so on. And there's a lot of public interest in basically discovering things. And a lot of the time we're pushed to do research of economic importance. Um, but in fact, when the Census of Marine Life had a 10 year program, the things that the media liked most was new species discoveries because everybody gets it. We want to discover things. You want to discover new chemicals, new elements, new physics particles, and new species. And there's just so many um, species on Earth that are so extraordinary um, that people, the public, appreciate it and say, OK, that's, that's good research. It, we don't know what value it has now, but it may have value in the future because we're understanding about life on Earth. And in fact, all the three major religions, that I think, if I'm not offending any of the other religions, have told us that we have to name species. So in the Christian Bible, um, God apparently told man, because at this time there weren't any women, there were only men in the world apparently. Um, we, that's another unsolved mystery. Um, he said, go and call, call each species and give it its name. <clears throat> and the same in the Quran, Allah told Adam to go and tell them the names of things. And even in the Sikh holy scriptures um, a thousand years ago, um, they also came up with a number. So this is the first estimate we know in history of how many species exist on Earth. And they said 8,400,000 species. And amazingly, this is the same number that other people, scientists have come up with independently sometimes. <clears throat> so where they got this information, we don't know because they don't tell us where they got the information, but maybe they had a, a higher power. And knowing marine biodiversity is a good place to start because uh, the marine biodiversity is, is quite extraordinary. Um, and also it's got a lot of endemic phyla because life began in the oceans. Um, it nearly went extinct in the oceans a few times as well, but there's 13 phyla only occur in the ocean. And that's why when people look at figures like this of these extraordinary marine animals, they say diversity is really the highest in the oceans because it's just so, so different. It's got such high evolutionary or phylogenetic diversity. <clears throat> And lots of these species st are still being discovered um, every year. In fact, there's nearly 2,000 marine species described every year for the last decade or more, and about 16,000 species in total. But there's problems in counting species. One is that most of us only ever look at one location or one particular taxon, because the more that people discover, the harder it is to get you know, our minds around it, especially within the time frame of a PhD or a master's or even somebody's career. Um, and also taxonomy is very messy because people have been naming species for a few hundred years. And in the early days, the descriptions weren't very good. So many species have many names. And this problem is, is, is much worse than we realized. Um, but these problems can be solved by creating global databases where experts share their knowledge. And of course, the databases are never perfect, but that's part of the exciting thing is to keep correcting them over time with new information. So we call this field of using databases to help biodiversity science, biodiversity informatics. And the three databases I'll talk about are the World Register of Marine Species, um, Species 2000 or the Catalog of Life, which includes most of the marine species, but also uh, all the terrestrial and fresh, most freshwater and terrestrial species. And the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, now called the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, 
And I was very privileged to lead the establishment of the worms, the World Register Mean Species, and OBUS during the um, 2000s years. And the kind of information we have in these databases, this is a species that uh, I described with my supervisor as part of my PhD. So we have the species name, we have its genus and its classification, we have the authors, um, and we know the years that are described. So we could look at this information now at a global scale using these databases to look at the trends. And this is one of the problems with, with synonyms is that these two fish look completely different and Linnaeus described both, but he didn't know that one was the male and one was the female. Um, and in fact, the male changes into a female over time. So, or it's the other way around, I forget. Um, but both Latin names are widely used until about 10 years ago and people sorted this out, but it gets worse. The sperm whale, which is almost cosmopolitan, lives in all the oceans, and most children could identify the shape of the sperm whale. Well, Linnaeus named it three times, other taxonomists named it three times, so it's got 19 scientific names, even more scientific names than it has common names. And other species of whales are even worse. This is the humpbacked whale in the North Atlantic. It's got 84 common names and over 40 scientific names. And in fact, in the cetaceans, so groups of animals and plants that are very popular, more people name them more often. So they actually get more complicated. And we need to take account of these synonyms when we're estimating how many species exist or else we'll be overestimating. So using the World Register Main Species, it, this is the number of synonyms uh, recognized per year in the red line at the top. And down the bottom is the number of synonyms recognized per year, this is the cumulative number. So then this, sorry, this is the number of valid species on the top. Um, so it looks like more and more species are recognized as valid, but of course it takes, it's a very boring job to go back through taxonomic descriptions and sort out which species are valid and then check the specimens at the museums and so on. So people don't do it very often. Um, so some of these names we still think are valid and have been described recently may turn out to be synonyms because somebody might do some genetic studies and say, hey, these two populations that, okay, they look quite different, but actually they're, they've got gene flow and they're, they're, they're not different genetically. Um, but it's, as you can see, it's quite a big problem, but most synonyms were created about uh, in the last century when people would describe in books and monographs occasionally published and it was much harder to get information. So we hope practice is now much better because people have greater access to literature in the last uh, few decades. And if we look at the number of species being described every year, so I've got marine in blue on the right axis and terrestrial on land, and this is thousands of species uh, per year. Um, we can see that there's a trend from Linnaeus up to the end of the last, uh, the, pre the 18th century, then that this is around 1911 or 1910, I think is the peak here. And you see the effects of the world wars, which are decrease in description rates. And that on terrestrial systems, really there's been a very small increase in numbers of land species and freshwater species described. Uh, since the Second World War. This is kind of surprising um, because we know there's been a big increase in science and a big increase in universities and institutes all over the world. And in contrast, there's been a huge increase in marine species descriptions. And this is not so surprising because we know that most of the marine laboratories and research vessels all began in the 1960s and 70s and 80s and um, marine science has grown rapidly in, in the last 50 years. And in fact, these trends have continued. I haven't updated this graph, but the marine ones are still increasing here, marine numbers of new marine species. And one of the things we didn't look at first, because we assumed that the number of authors was decreasing because everybody said so. So when we analyzed the database, it was a big surprise to see that the number of authors, that is the people describing species, has been increasing so much. Um, about six times more authors now describing marine species than ever before. But it's also the case with every group of species we look at. Um, and there's a little small line here. This is the, if you just take the first authors, and this is if you take all the authors in, in, a, in describing species, because sometimes a species is described by one or more people, and we need to take those uh, into account. So if authors is an estimate of effort, 
then this suggests that uh, we've got increasing effort, which might be explaining the increasing numbers of marine species being described. And sorry, down the bottom graph here is the non-marine, which is terrestrial and freshwater and versus marine. And we can look at um, publications as another measure of effort. People have done that, but it's very highly correlated, like 0 0.9 something with the numbers of authors. Um, and it's been increasing, the numbers of authors and publications have been increasing on all continents and in all taxa, and especially in Asia and South America. So if we divide the number of species been described in a year or five year or 10 year time period by the number of authors active in that time period, we have decreasing trends both for marine overall time in fact, and for terrestrial, especially since 1911. So this suggests we're getting a decreasing catch per unit effort. So to my mind, this suggests that it's, it's not just so easy to find new species anymore, that we are maybe more than halfway in discovering marine species. And what we're now finding is the less common species, the more endemic ones. We did a big review of this with the World Register Marine Species Editors. So we had 117 of the editors at the time were authors. And we, this was the first kind of compilation of how many species are named in all these groups, how many synonyms, um, and how many species those experts thought may exist and yet to be described. And also many had estimates of how many specimens they had in their collections they knew were new species, but hadn't yet described. So there was three ways of estimating how many species might exist, a statistical model, the percentage of undescribed species and samples, and just experts brainstorming. <clears throat> and if we look at the number of undescribed species found in different studies, and we've 100 studies in this paper, the median and the mean, which are pretty close together, which suggests that the data is representative, um, it was around 30, let's say one third of species were undescribed in 100 studies. So that would suggest that if this applied to the whole world, um, that two thirds of species have been named. And of course, there's many studies that can describe all the species in their samples or don't try to, so they don't know how many are under, under unnamed species. So we they developed a statistical model, which takes into account the variation between each year, because most of the, uh, the models fitted to this type of data usually don't uh, produce uh, accurate confidence limits going forward into the future. And this is published in a statistical journal, and we showed that the model is a reasonably good fit to past data. And if we compared here the three different estimates, so the red is the expert opinion, the yellow is the, um, is the, which is the yellow, I've forgotten. The circles, the, the circles are the, the model prediction and the blue is the numbers of named species. So it looks like there's, a, if we just ranked the species here, it looks like the algae, chromista, the nematodes, the flatworms, these are the groups of the biggest difference between expert opinion and what the data are showing. But a year later, the same experts here, they were, I guess, inspired by this paper, went and looked at the algae again, and they revised this estimate here right down to a much lower estimate. And the same with the nematodes, another paper by different authors suggested there's around 15 species in nematode. And some people had been suggesting there were millions, but unfortunately not. But there are theoretical reasons why this might be the case. And if we look at other global scale studies by taxonomic experts, how many species did they believe are known? And here we see for fish and sea anemones, flowering plants, algae, you know, all marine species, that last paper, and various groups of marine taxa, that they all come up with a number roughly around two thirds of species are known, and we might have yet to name one third more. Another way of looking at it is, is to compare the numbers of new species um, described per year with the number of species already known, and this is highly correlated. So this suggests that we have a pretty good representative sample of species diversity per higher taxon on Earth. And if we even leave out the insects, which are way up here, <clears throat> over a million, and the higher plants, we still get a very high correlation. So putting all this together, if we estimate how many species are unknown, which is roughly a third across these taxa, and we know how many are known in the database, and I, I, I subtracted about 20% for synonyms that have yet to be identified here. And the unknown, 
I end up with a total of around 2 million species probably exist on Earth. Now, it could be 100,000 more or less. We, we don't really know yet. Um, but this is one of the lower estimates that is presently around. But some decades ago, other experts like Kevin Gaston and Bob May were also suggesting around 2 million. And then there was a phase of hyperestimates from local scale deep sea studies and other projects which said, well, and, and, and of course, the famous Irwin estimates of the beetles on trees in, in the Amazon, um, which multiplied from local scale studies up to global scale studies using ratios. And the danger of using a ratio is that the, the, at very low ratios, you end up with doubling and trebling numbers very easily. So these ended up at huge figures for how many species may exist on Earth, perhaps uh, 100 million in one case. But there's some reasons in biogeography why I think this estimate is probably more accurate. Um, one being that the more and more studies we do, the more they seem to support it. But what about microscopic species, parasites, and deep sea species? And parasites even have parasites. So if maybe, maybe these species are, and, and they also tend to be less uh, quickly discovered and described than other species, perhaps. And um, so if we include microbes as not just bacteria, but protozoans, some of the most of the fungi, nematodes, and some other microfauna, but some of the marine ones are quite um, low in numbers of species, actually kind of hundreds to a few thousand species per group. Um, and we classify them into major size groups. We see that the megafauna, which are greater than 10 centimeters, are classified here. Um, there's relatively few species, so that doesn't surprise us. We all know there's birds and mammals or reptiles are kind of outnumbered by the invertebrates. And this macro group here of all the insects, crustaceans, mollusks, and other arthropods um, is, is the dominant numbers of species on Earth. And actually the microfauna is far less. And it's the same, this is for all species on Earth. And it's the same if we look at the oceans, although they do seem to be proportionally more small animals uh, and plants in the ocean. And this may be related to the planktonic lifestyle. So microscopic species don't seem to be more diverse. Um, and if we look at how widespread species are, we find that in the ocean, it's the plankton, the microscopic plankton which float around and the megafauna which fly and swim across the oceans that make up the most widespread species. So species that are very widespread will have high gene flow and then they will, or taxa that are, very widespread enough hygiene flow will form new species because they're constantly exchanging genes. But they may also have very high genetic diversity if they've got very large populations. <clears throat> um, and the other area people come up with is cryptic molecular cryptic species. So they often point out that viruses and bacteria have very high genetic diversity. But there is a hypothesis, which I just noted at the bottom here, the bass becking hypothesis, that for the microbes, everything is everywhere and the environment selects where species live. And this seems to be largely true for a lot of these microbes because they're dispersed in the air and the water and on animals and other things. Um, so they've got very high gene flow. And if we compare the diversity, people often think in their papers, they find more genetic diversity. So they immediately jump to the conclusion, well, this means we must have more species. But if we look at this macro level, in fact, it's the opposite relationship. For multicellular animals and plants have less genetic diversity than protozoans, which have less than bacteria, which have less than viruses. So in fact, it's kind of the opposite relationship. These little organisms have very high gene flow and form fewer species. On parasites, <clears throat> several people have uh, suggested in papers that they find roughly the same number of parasite species in a community as they do host species. So if every host has one parasite specific to it, then half of all species should be parasites, but only about 5% of species are parasites. Um, we were just doing a, a new analysis and maybe it's around 10% now and depending how one classifies parasites, but it's still a very, very small proportion. It's not anywhere near half. So I looked at parasite rates of descriptions and these are terrestrial ones, all those biting ticks and um, flies and fleas and microsporidian, which are little protozoans. These are all the biting flies down here. And we, this is the number of species uh, described per year with a three year moving average. 
And it's been decreasing in all these groups for decades. So this is not a time lag into the databases because I contacted the experts for each of these groups and I said, you know, is there data missing here? How would you explain this? And they say, no, this is true. So in fact, terrestrial parasites are quite well described and many of them are problems for people and for our farm animals and domestic animals. So maybe that's why they're really well studied. So what about the marine ones? Well, if we look at the marine ones, I've grouped them here into helminth worms, which are the, 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 the flukes that live on the skin or inside the gut of organisms, um, crustaceans and mollusks. <clears throat> and actually the numbers of species being described for crustaceans and mollusks has been decreasing, but it's been increasing rapidly for the helminth worms, which are mostly endoparasites. And similarly for the number of authors per year, it's kind of flattened out for the helminth worms, but it's been decreasing for crustaceans and mollusks. So to me, this is quite a big surprise because I thought parasites would be less well known than the hosts, but it looks like parasites are better known than most of their hosts. And I have another PhD student, he's working on this now with a big database on sharks and their parasites. And indeed this is, seems to be the case because as we discover more hosts, we find that they have the same parasites that existed on other hosts. Um, and that suddenly parasites are not so host specific. And why would they be in evolutionary terms? Because it wouldn't pay to only live on one host all the time because if that host went extinct, the parasite would go extinct. So most parasites will live on alternative hosts given the opportunity. So that's basically what I said here that most parts are a lot more flexible with their hosts, but they're very hard to sample because they're often such low density that we tend to always underestimate how many parasites occur in a population, a parasite species. So deep sea diversity is also quite extraordinary and some really weird things live down there. <clears throat> and the hypothesis, which came from a paper by Saunders and Hessler back in the 1960s, was that the, ocean, the deep sea is very stable. Um, and it seems to be in the way that it's got more or less stable temperature, very little seasonal change. Um, and it's got the largest volume and area of the planet is between 2000 and 6,000 meters depth. So in fact, most of our planet is deep sea. Um, and it's the oceans are where life started. So it would seem an ideal place to have high diversity because over such a long time, what they didn't really realize then, of course, is that during the great mass extinctions, all life in the deep sea probably went extinct because it went anoxic. So in fact, the, the deep sea has been repeatedly colon, recolonized by shallow water organisms. And if we look at the coastal habitats, that's where we have all these uh, plant dominated biomes of coral reefs, seagrass, kelp and mangroves, which provide a three dimensional and food rich habitat for many species. Um, a, a former student of mine, uh, Danusha, has mapped um, seagrass biome and she's done the kelp biome more recently and updated it. Um, and if we put these together into four maps, we see that all of these major marine biomes are very coastal. And some of them, like the coral reefs, which have got phytoplankton in them, so, um, not phytoplankton, but algae, symbiotic algae, um, occur in the tropics and other coastal areas. So the deep sea in the open ocean area really has a very little three-dimensional habitat. And most productivity in the oceans, usually when people plot a map of ocean productivity, they plot it in the, in the summer time or the springtime in the north or the south. But if we take the annual average, we can see the red areas here is that most ocean productivity is around the coast because that's where you get the nitrogen and the iron from the land that the phytoplankton need to grow. And it's also strongly in the, in the tropics and the warmer areas. So in fact, the Arctic and Antarctic have relatively low productivity. And there are some really extraordinary habitats in the deep sea, but they don't really cover the same area and they're not as productive as the shallow water habitats. And there's some really unusual ones like hydrothermal vents, which are highly productive with extraordinary abundance of animals, but they don't have a very high number of species. So if we look at some of the world databases on uh, one is Obis, which includes all kinds of animals. So it's really, you, there is abundance data in it, but it's really hard to compare abundances across such different groups. So we just look at species presence. 
And we can compare the OBUS map, which is down here, which is the distribution data for 65,000 species, and red is more and green is less. And I used uh, ES50, where you, you take repeated samples, so you, you count the number of species in every 50 samples, you end up with a, an average and a mean and, and confidence limits. Um, and another way of looking at that is that people model all these species ranges. And this is Aquamaps, which at this time had 10,000 species, but now has 25,000 species ranges, and you overlap them. And the darker it is, is where there's more species. Suppose the maps agree um, that most species are coastal and tropical. And another way of looking at this data is with depth. So uh, Chaya Chaudhari, um, my PhD student, took the areas of ocean and equal area hexagons, which had enough data with depth. So there's obviously large areas of deep sea missing data here. And she plotted the numbers of species going deeper. And if we take the number of samples, of course, that decreases as we go deeper. And this is on a log scale. And if we take the total number of species, that rapidly decreases in the first 100 meters. And if you calculate it as the mean number of species with confidence limits, you see the confidence limits are very small. Um, or the ES50 that also rapidly increases. So whatever index we use of uh, species richness, we end up with rapidly decreasing richness as you go deeper. And the great trick we have in textbooks, I realized because I was teaching and I wanted to find some graphs, is that a lot of deep sea studies, they never sample in the top 200 meters. They go out in a big ship and they take all their data from like somewhere around a thousand meters and then they go downwards and then they, they they kind of aggregate it. So often they come up with these very wavy lines as you go deeper because they're looking at local scale variation in their study site. And they've missed out the most species rich part of the, the coastal area. And we could try to explain these patterns by looking at the environmental context. And we've, uh, another of my PhD students, he created this uh, World Global Environmental Marine data sets to help us do that. Um, and there are several other uh, good ones as well, and they're improving all the time. <clears throat> so if we show the, the depth gradient for temperature, nitrate, the primary nutrient for the plants in the ocean, and oxygen, we can see that there's the epipelagic, which is just the surface area above the red line, above 200 meters. So this is where all the action is in terms of um, warmer temperatures, um, variable nitrates. The nitrate is low here because the plants are using it up. And the oxygen is much higher because plants are releasing it and it's absorbing from the surface. But as we go deeper, the lines get much smoother, accepting that this is the maximum, the minimum, the minimum and the mean in each case. Um, so as we go to the deep sea, we're back, we're down to really below 500 meters or so, nearly all the deep sea is less than four, degree, four degrees. And four degrees is the temperature our fridge should be. So below, a thousand meters, the deep sea is basically like our fridge if we kept the door closed for a long time. It's completely dark, low productivity, and very cold. Um, so why would people think that you would have a whole lot of species evolving in the deep sea? Um, well, I guess they didn't have this environmental data at the time to do these analyses. And even if we look at currents, the deep sea also has far lower currents than you get in surface waters. Um, and if we look at the maximum or the coefficient of variation to take the variability into account, the deep sea is much calmer and um, less turbulent than the surface conditions. So it's got less heterogeneity. Um, so if a species lives in the deep sea, it should be able to occupy a much bigger area because the environment is so similar over a very, very large area. Another way of looking at that is looking at three dimensions. This is a, a database created by Esri who make ArcGIS. It's freely available online. And they create these ecological marine units based on temperature, salinity, oxygen, nitrate, phosphate, and silicate. And if we do a profile of these, in the coastal area, there is about 20 small ecological marine units in here. And as we go deeper, we get fewer and fewer because even though it's a much larger volume and larger area, the environment is much more similar as we go deeper. So this means that species that live in this area, they'll be able to live in all of this blue area here or this orange area or green area here. Their habitat is basically enormous. And this is what we see when we look at the depth ranges of any taxonomic group. I took this example of sea pens because they're kind of cool. 
Um, and each bar here is a different genus of sea pen, and they're just ranked by their depth range. So we can see that all the narrow depth range ones are here in shallow water. And as we go deeper, the deeper species have much bigger depth ranges because we now know that the environment is very similar in all this area. So this is why we have less deep sea species, because if we do a count across this graph, you count up the number of species in each row, and you see that most species will be in shallow water and very few deep. And there's in fact only one species of sea pen that is believed to be endemic to the deep sea, but it has very few records. So it's quite likely that in the future, people will find it in shallower water. Um, and we can classify all deep sea diversity using cluster analysis into different groups, but I, I won't go into details on that here, but it supports the previous analysis. So using by geography, we can explain why species richness varies between taxa due to different gene flows and their abundance and geographically as well. So, so far, am I doing on time? Yep. <clears throat> um, what I would conclude at the moment is that roughly of the species on Earth, 15% are marine, about 10% are microscopic, and 5% are parasites. Um, and most marine species are coastal and tropical, and perhaps 2 million species exist, of which we're very close to having named all of them. We've probably named two thirds, but that's still hundreds of thousands more species to be discovered. And we still need to sort out all the synonyms and have good identification guides to these species. So there's still a lot of taxonomy needing to be done. <clears throat> so a couple of ways of applying this knowledge. Um, one was looking at extinction rates, and I mentioned that in my opening slides. Um, and the reason that the 1 million estimate was mentioned by IPBS was because they estimated that there were 8 million species. They took a number of 8 million species on Earth. Um, so when they, they multiplied it by the ratio of species assessed by IECN, they came up with 1 million, which is a very nice number and, and a cool number for um, the popular media and scientists to repeat. You know, if they came up with a number like 78,500, nobody would remember. So they had, to, they had to come up with a pretty good number. Um, so one application is looking at uh, marine biodiversity and where to have protected areas. Um, Raman Assad did his PhD with me. He worked for the Ministry of Forestry in Indonesia. And the Minister of Forestry, interestingly enough, and is also for parks, and parks includes marine parks. And as part of the his government had been creating many marine protected areas in Indonesia, many of them to support local communities and prevent industrial fishing, but many also completely no-take marine areas. Um, and it was a fact, we knew some of the scientists and the people that are involved in setting these up. And it was actually pretty easy to convince local communities that they should have some marine reserves because these people live with seafood, they have a history of collecting it. So they know that the ocean seafood can be impacted by people and they want to protect it. And they know the idea of leaving us an area unfished because that's also been traditional in all the Southeast Asian and Pacific Island communities. So while in Europe, um, and I don't know about South America so much, but in Europe, it's completely alien idea not to go fishing somewhere. In Norway, there is nowhere, even in the marine protected areas, you're not allowed to take seaweed, you're not allowed to take rocks, but you can go fishing. Same in Ireland, where I did my PhD. They're, they have a marine reserve, but you're allowed to go fishing there because, hey, everybody can go fishing. That doesn't cause any harm. So the, there's a very utilitarian attitude towards the ocean in, in European mindsets. Uh, but in indigenous communities work, living with nature, they, they have a completely different attitude towards, towards nature and they respect it more, um, as, as probably um, you guys know already. <clears throat> So Raman first uh, reviewed criteria used to select and prioritize conserva conservation areas. He then collected data from around the Coral Triangle on endemic species of fish. It was a really nice database. And the dark area here shows that this little place here, Roger Ampat, the bird's head seascape, has got the highest number of endemic species. And these are what they call neo-endemics, which means all these species arose in these places. So they're representative of the high richness. So the highest richness is also in this place of species. He collected data on coral, seagrass, mangroves, uh, 
data from the OBIS system and data on sea turtles, usually tracking sea turtle tracks around the ocean. And he put all this together and you can use decision-making software to decide where would be the best places to protect um, marine biodiversity. Because if you picked uh, say 20%, which is the top 20%, top 30% and so on. And he did that for his PhD and, and posted it online. So this is quite a good guidance because it gives guidance to, to, and to all local communities and to be able to say, hey, you know, you've got some of the richest biodiversity uh, in all of Indonesia and in all of the world, in fact. So it's really important that you protect it. And people are proud of that. So following around on successful work, we went on to do this for the world. We had mapped regions of endemicity using the OBIS data. So this is basically using a cluster analysis and you come up with areas that have uh, high endemicity and this would be a hierarchical network. And in fact, a similar thing has been done for Brazil. So this is by uh, Sergio Flutter and um, his group um, and others in Brazil. So they've done the same for the Brazilian coast. And when we did this study, we actually didn't have any data for the coastal area here. So this just got merged with a big Atlantic region. So this is a really nice study using a very comparable method. And they show that there's actually three biogeographic regions, if not four, along the coast of Brazil. So future studies with better data should be able to improve on these everywhere around the world. But to do the world map of where most biodiversity was, species richness on its own would just plot out the areas of most species, but it would leave out all the areas with unique species but fewer species. So we nested richness within these biogeographic realms here, and we came up with a map of adjusted species richness within areas of endemicity. And then we combined this with other measures of biodiversity, of ecosystems, biomes, and habitat, which we use the seabed variation or rugosity. And this is the map that uh, Chenchur Zhao published as part of his PhD, showing the areas where most biodiversity is. And about, um, oh, I've forgotten the number, but a significant, nearly half of these regions are not, I think more than half is coastal. It's probably was it 60%. And I think about 40% is actually in areas outside of countries' exclusive economic zones. So you can see many areas in mid-ocean ridges around ocean islands um, are prioritized for conservation as well, and in polar regions. Whereas most of the traditional um, areas where people would regard as hotspots of biodiversity would have been around the coral reefs in the Caribbean and the Coral Triangle and around Australia and parts of African coast, East Africa. So we could also use this data then to look at climate change. And Hania Saidi um, did her PhD with me on razor clams. She came from Iran and had done her master's on them. And so she was very interested and did a global analysis of their biogeography and went to the museums around the world. And when she first did this graph, which is just numbers of species with latitude going from the north to the south here. Um, and we found this drop at the equator. We assumed, because many other studies had noticed a little decrease, that this is due to undersampling. But when she went to the museums and she clarified the taxonomy, she found actually most species either existed in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, and very few crossed over the equator. So this was kind of surprising, um, but with pretty good data, she went to a biogeography conference. They said, great, send your paper to the Journal of Biogeography. She sent it there. They accepted the paper, but they said, you cannot call this a bimodal graph because we all know that it's not bimodal, um, as this is just some kind of problem with your data. And uh, we were very cross about this because we thought the coolest thing about the project was it was bimodal. And even if it's only one taxonomic group, it's still bimodal. Um, so we did a literature review and with uh, Chaya, which is just starting her PhD. And we found that every single group we looked at on the, ocean, the marine environment had a little decrease at the equator. Um, so she reviewed also 60 studies, and most studies, they either drew, drew a line across the dip or they just, only one or two studies commented on it. Um, because everybody believed that richness peaks at the equator, that's what everybody says. So people interpreted their data to fit what other people had said. So if we looked at numbers of species per latitude, of course there's more in the Northern hemisphere because there's more sampling, 
if we look at total, this is the average. If we look at total, it evens out. We've got a big dip around the equator. And if we use the estimated richness, we still see this dip here. And these are the error bars. So this is roughly, it's also symmetrical. And what the symmetrical nature suggests to, to us is that this is basically temperature because temperature shows a nice graph, peaks over the equator and then decreases again. Whereas if it was something else like shelf area or um, some other land area or sea area, when we tested all of these and we didn't get significant results, but then you wouldn't expect it to be symmetrical like that. However, if you do look at some individual taxa, we do find some variability. So some different taxa, I love the example of penguins, which are only in the South Pole, obviously they don't have the same pattern. So when you start breaking this down to different taxonomic groups, we find different interesting patterns based on their ecology and evolution. But overall, it's symmetrical and bimodal. Um, and just last month, Chaya published uh, this paper in PNAS. Um, so for all of species, and I just divide the data into before and after 1985, because after 1985, global warming has been much more consistent all over the world. So it kind of reduces the variability. And we couldn't do the data for very short time periods because we needed a lot of species in, this, in the samples to make sure we got good global coverage. But the blue is after and the red is before. So this is the number of species. So we can see this dip at the equator over all species and this increase um, in the subtropics. And this increase happens both for the seabed living benthic groups and for the pelagic. And we see a little shift downwards as well in the equator. So this is just what people predicted with climate change. And if we add up the numbers here, roughly some thousands of species have left the equator in the last 50 years, since the 1950s, last 70 years. Um, which is just what we expect from climate change. And they haven't gone extinct. They've moved into um, the subtropics, into higher latitudes. So they've stayed in their own environmental niche, but they have um, moved geographically. And this is quite easy in the sea because especially for the pelagic species here, we can see this, the shifts are very dramatic. They're just in open water and they can move with the water masses. And it looks like the benthic species don't show such a fast shift, but they are also moving. And that has been documented for many individual species. But now we can see that marine biodiversity has been changing in line in concert with climate change. But there are some other patterns. One of them is ecological gradient. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a, data, a standardized data set, the Reef Life Survey. And I think there are some samples in Brazil here, um, started by some Australians. Uh, and they have about 2000 study sites around the world, all sampled in exactly the same way. And here's some photographs. So seeing the cold Californian Channel Islands and the cold parts of Chile, the photographs almost tell the story because in the tropics, fish dominate everything. Fish are the dominant herbivores, uh, but below 20 degrees, you get almost no herbivorous fish. And even in the colder Northern, northern and Southern latitudes, um, invertebrates dominate the seabed. So here in Norway, where I'm living now, if I go for a dive, every rock and sediment, everything is covered in, uh, if it's not seaweeds, it's, it's uh, marine animals sitting on the seabed. And we see very few fish, um, and, and very few fish that actually eat benthos directly, that graze it. But when you go to the tropics, there's fish eating, grazing the coral, grazing the rocks, grazing the sediment everywhere. So we suggest that there's actually competition and the database suggests this as well. So for vertebrates, which is mainly fish, and this is zero equator here up to the higher latitudes in both hemispheres, we see a decrease in numbers of fish, richness and fish abundance, and a corresponding increase in mobile invertebrates, richness and abundance. So there are obviously some things yet to be discovered in these data sets. So to conclude, once upon a time, I thought most species were microscopic, marine, in the deep sea, taxonomic effort was decreasing and marine species richness peaked at the equator. Well, now I know that most species are not microscopic and because we know and they're not marine and are not in the deep sea. And the samples 
we already have of diversity appear representative of what we're still discovering. So these patterns are not going to change with future discoveries. And taxonomic effort is certainly not this decreasing because we know exactly the people's names are in the databases. We know what institutions they live at. And um, several people have done studies analyzing the literature and showing that, of course, there's been a huge increase in younger generation of taxonomists around the world who are not well known. And the oldest people who are retiring are very well known. So people always know the people that are, have spent 40 years publishing and they're retiring. They say, oh, it's very sad we're losing this older generation, but of course they don't know all the young people that are moving into the system. And maybe they use molecular methods more, and maybe they do phylogeny and other things as well as pure taxonomy. And the species richness peaks at the equator. In fact, I forgot to show a study um, which we did a year before looking at fossil data. And this actual dip at the equator happened since the last ice age. At the last ice age, richness did peak at the equator, but it started decreasing before industrial anthropogenic warming but it's been decreasing much faster now in the last few decades due to anthropogenic climate change. So the lessons for this, um, for any of the younger generation and maybe myself as well, I still need to learn a few. Um, we shouldn't believe all we read or hear. We should look for the data and facts to support things and then find good people to collaborate with. Thank you very much. I can take any questions. Well, some questions anyway. Thank you, Mark. It was really nice, really comprehensive, interesting talk. So as we usually do, we will have about half an hour for question, questions. So I'll just start in Portuguese. Então, pessoal, a gente tem essa meia hora aí de perguntas, como a gente sempre faz, quem está aqui no Zoom, se quiser ligar a câmera ou áudio para fazer as perguntas diretamente ao Mark, fique à vontade, ou se quiserem escrever Tudo bem, que a gente, eu falo aqui também. E quem está assistindo a gente no YouTube, podem colocar suas perguntas lá, tanto em português quanto em inglês, que a gente passa aqui para o Mark. Bom, eu vi que tem, acho que eu, tanto o Marquinho quanto a Mariana colocaram perguntas aqui. Vocês querem fazer as perguntas diretamente ou querem que eu leia? Mariana colocou primeiro aqui. Uh, I can I can ask. I, 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 think, I think Mark can read the question, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Yeah, that's good. That's a very good question. I think flatworms. Um, I knew some people uh, working Mark, on flatworms. Could you repeat the question so that the folks ah yeah, um, it says what are the least known taxa in terrestrial and marine realms where we expect to find more species that are new? Well, we still find more insects because there are more insects. So that's kind of a complicating factor. But uh, there's a lot of people working on insect. About half of insect species are described by amateurs. Um, I think in South America, there was a study as well as the same in Europe. Um, in the marine environment, I think flatworms, free living flatworms are really lots of species being discovered because they're very hard to sample. You have to get them alive. Um, and then you have to fix them and describe them from the living specimens. And they're very hard to find. Um, so may maybe marine flatworms are an interesting group. Um, but of course the groups with most species already tend to have most new species still to be discovered. I used to think it was the myofauna, like carpactacoid copepods and some of these small things, but uh, there's some Russians who, the Russians do amazing taxonomy, a lot of these groups, and they actually show that the myofauna, the marine myofauna are very cosmopolitan. They find the same species in the Atlantic Ocean and Indian Ocean and Arctic, um, which kind of surprised us, but it, it fits the fast specking hypothesis idea, so, yeah. Nice. Um, do you want to to keep in this? Do you want to read, or do you want me to read, Mark? What? Do you oh, prefer? I can I can read it. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, uh, pergunta. No, no. It's pergunta. Who's pergunta? Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> as Mariana so, asked the second question as well. There's, yeah, we have. No, no. First, oh, I see. There's uh, no, there's lots more questions. Sorry, I got yes. confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> I just have to expand. I have to ex expand my screen. <laughs> um, yeah, the criteria used to define species. So, you know, people go on about this a lot. I'm involved in an IUBS working group, which we debate this too. But actually, most taxonomists don't argue that much about separating species, because most of them use morphological, ecological sometimes physiological and genetic information nowadays. But the one group that's really interesting is the fungi, 
So we just finished a master's project looking at fungi and fungi were kind of well known and sort of leveling off. And then suddenly in the 1980s, they just took off and they're all using molecular information to describe the species. So every fungus paper, new fungus species since 1980s has molecular data. So I think they have changed their concept. But of course, they also use morphological data, but usually it's hopeless because it's like <laughs> the cell is circular with you know, <laughs> no morphological features. But so they, they are using morphological, but it's not really diagnostic. So I think in fungi, um, and fungi are really fascinating because they can exchange DNA. Some fungi even take DNA from plants and I, so some plants and fungi and bacteria really do crazy things with DNA. So what is a species to them? I think they're a bit gender fluid as well. So, you know, it's a bit, a bit hard to define. Um, yeah. yeah. I Mark, I made the question. It's just, yeah. uh, I was relating to something similar in birds when they started using molecular data for birds and the number of species doubled or the rate of discovered species starting to double mm. just because they are finding more genetic diversity using molecular data. Birds are completely different from fungi, but something similar happened then. So yeah. that's, why I, that's why I made the question. Yeah, it's very true. And it's, then the, the birds actually in mammals are the ones, you know, even human, you know, what, what is Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, people play around with the word species very loosely in a lot of these things, which leads to some confusion. So I think, and of course, none of the species concepts work perfectly. I mean, nobody can test how the, if species interbreed and then, well, we know a lot of species, separate species we regard as, as separate species can interbreed. And some species don't have any sex at all and are very successful. So it's, it is a difficult question, but, but by and large in the databases, most taxonomists agree most of the time on the species, you know, and even, even with the birds, they're, they're reaching more consensus, I think, these days, you know, they, okay, we can agree it's either, we know they're very closely related, you can either call them a, a species group or separate species, but they all have different names if people want to use them, yeah. And maybe, maybe this is the future, you know, because biodiversity is not just about species, but it's about variation within species. So these variations and call them subspecies or varieties, they're still part of the biodiversity, so. Hmm. Um, most of the, uh, do, 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 do. oh, why does marine richness decrease at the equator again? Um, I think it's just because of temperature. Because um, we looked at everything else and, and temperature explains it so nicely and it explains the change over time. And even in the fossil record, we can see the signal of temperature, it just gets too warm. And we have a paper under review for the second time now where we looked at, um, we brought in, um, People who work on cell physiology and strange things, we never talk to them normally. It's dangerous to talk to people. And we actually had two workshops and none of us could understand this guy at the first workshop. <laughs> uh, but at the second workshop, we suddenly realized he had an amazing discovery. So he looked at, um, so apparently cell uh, function is most stable at 20 degrees centigrade, so at a molecular level. And this is something to do with the properties of water. So most, so all cells have to create proteins and break down proteins. And this cycle is most efficient at 20 degrees. So he looked at, at um, all the domains of life in the literature and bacteria, protozoans, eukaryotes. And he finds that the most stable temperature over all these different domains and kingdoms is 20 degrees. It was amazing. And in fact, when we sent the paper the first time to the journal, one of the referees, referees said he can't believe this. <laughs> um, because, you know, okay, we know some species live in the polar ages and some live in the tropics. So they're adapted to the higher and colder temperatures, but nearly all species can live at 20 degrees. Um, and so I think that there's a fundamental property of biochemistry that limits, that makes 20 degrees the ideal temperature. And the equator, of course, has been over 20 degrees now um, for a lot of marine life. And there's even, I found a few references for terrestrial things, I think soil chemistry, uh, plant productivity, a lot of these things start decreasing when you go over 20 degrees because the rate of respiration gets higher than the rate of photosynthesis. So in fact, life on earth is really, would really like to live at 20 degrees, please. But if we make it warmer, 
at the equator, it's just not, it's, you know, it's more and more stressful and less and less species can live there. Still, most species are there, but fewer. Yeah. But, but why do we have so many, so, so much more species in the tropics and terrestrial environments? That's, if there is yeah. this, like, this, the, this general rule of 20 degrees mm. and... Exactly. That's what wonder, we wonder, too. I also wonder why uh, warm-blooded animals live at around 37, 38, 40 degrees. You know, why wouldn't they live at a lower temperature? I still haven't figured that one out. But I think what happens is that is the old idea of, of uh, evolution being faster and more competitive above 20 degrees. Because above 20 degrees, you need energy all the time. You need food to grow and survive. So you have to keep foraging. Um, and so this creates greater competition. So the, the, the old idea of greater competition driving uh, species uh, diversification in the tropics is, is still true. And that's why you end up with more species. But it's basically a race. They're all just competing for those resources. And everything's happening all the time. Whereas in the colder latitudes, you basically, they, could, they get a winter holiday. You know, they all, they all sleep in the winter. And so that's half the year gone. They can't grow for all that time. So evolution has got to be colder in colder environments because A, it's slower and it's more seasonal um, because it just gets too cold some of the times as well. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm speculating a bit, but it, it sort of makes sense with what people were saying. Mark, just to let you know, whatever is written, pergunta, I don't know if you read, if you heard yeah. Mariana, it means question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all the data they asked about the data sets, worms and obus. Yes, they're all open access. Uh, actually, worms is a bit annoying because we thought it was open access, but they have a limit on the number of downloads. So you should write emails to the uh, guys at the website and complain about that <laughs> because they didn't even tell us. We were the editors. We thought everybody could get everything until somebody, my students, complained. And I said, What? And then they said, Oh, it's because of download and I said, but that's not a problem anymore. So they're thinking about changing it, but the committees, some people, for some reason, want to restrict the download. I don't know why, but uh, yeah. So in theory, you can get a, you you can get everything, but you have to ask for worms. And Ob Obus is completely open access. They got lots of really good OR codes, and they're really responsive to people. They want people to use the database because the more people use it, the the, the more. Uh, resources they will get from the UNESCO, which, which funds them. Um, so UNESCO is a governmental funded organization, so they got to show benefits to researchers. Um, so there's a question from Lelis about, are currents responsible for the lack of endemicity in smaller species in the shallow? Shouldn't the deep sea have higher endemicity, especially for small tax? Very good question as well. So. What happens in the deep sea, and they've shown this for some of the hydrothermal vent species, is because if a hydrothermal vent is a small and temporary habitat, then to live there, it's like living in a pond, a freshwater pond. You have to be able to disperse long distances. So most deep sea species only need to float up into the water, maybe with neutral buoyancy, and, they, and then they just drift with those very slow currents until they find suitable benthic habitat, and then they settle down and grow again. And because the temperature is so cold, they don't need much energy to do it. Um, and it's interesting that some of the deep sea crustaceans, there's the isopod crustaceans, they're all swimming isopods. And the reason they can live in the deep sea, because they, they look just like fish food, um, is because there aren't any fish there, to, very few fish there to eat them. So, th so they can just swim up in the water column, they smell for food, and then they drift and, and swim around. So people find these when they use these bait, uh, bait cameras in the deep sea. They suddenly discover all these crustaceans and strange fish turning up out of nowhere. Um, yeah, so, 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 but those, and because the deep sea is so homogenous, it means they live at a low density, but in those huge areas. Yeah. Oh, and that, um, yeah, Stella asked about, I asked, answered about the dip of the equator already. Yeah, thermal limits, yeah. Um, and uh, Giselle, Ask me, um, oh, the inverse correlation in richness and abundance between fish and large invertebrates. Um, yeah, in the reef life survey, large um, mobile invertebrates are basically what scuba divers can identify. So 
crabs, uh, lobsters, um, starfish, um, mussels, things, things like that. Yeah, because they're, they're just right. They're just taking photographs and writing everything down on a, on a slate. Yeah, I actually have a, have a paper with um, a Spanish student who came and visited us. She looked at um, all the other things you've mentioned, the bent they convert bits that form reefs like sponges, corals, mussels, bryozoans, tube building worms. And when she plotted the latitudinal gradient of them, it's depressed at the equator. So it's also higher in the subtropics, but actually the Antarctica has got the same numbers of species of these benthic invertebrates as the tropics do. So we were kind of amazed. And then we realized that the Antarctica has been a, glacier, a climatic refugium for basically millions and millions of years. It's been separate, half the species in Antarctica are endemic. So, and it's, it's got very few fish and the fish that live there, they don't, none of them are really grazing or biting fish. They're just these planktonic organisms. So the benthos basically, benthic animals have the place to themselves and they, they just diversified and, and taken over. Yeah, so good, good question. And maybe there's some other cold areas, maybe in deeper sea where there's less fish. Um, yeah, maybe they'd be more diverse. Yeah. Very nice, Mark. Uh, I have one question too. Uh, I was thinking about the, the conservation aspect of your talk. Mm -hmm. And then in this in the very interesting paper of Zhao, and you guys um, just mapped the, the areas in which we could protect, right, the, the, in terms of biodiversity. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, sometimes, at least from my experience, sometimes we, it, it's hard for us to, to talk to people, not managers, not uh, scientists, just regular people. Uh, about richness and diversity. And in mm. several times, it's more easy for us to, to talk about conservation when we talk about uh, a, a specific species. So mm. marine turtles, uh, yeah. seabirds, marine mammals. So I was, I was wondering about your experience and how do you, do you think about using a, a charismatic umbrella species versus representativeness by diversity? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so my, I have another PhD student, Tamlin Jefferson, who's just compared threatened marine species and they're, if we want to protect them, where we should protect them. Mm -hmm. And the problem is things like turtles and you know, other large organisms travel the ocean. They have a completely different biogeography to most species. And they're often not very well correlated. So in the, even in the Coral Triangle study, there was no relationship between where turtles were and the rest of biodiversity. They, mm -hmm. they were completely... <laughs> turtles were where their nesting yeah. grounds were that was the only concentration so they yeah. wouldn't be very good umbrella species in that case uh, but we do need to consider all species and we can use these yeah, free decision making software like sonation to actually mm -hmm. to make decisions about how do you protect a, a sufficient area to have a sufficient size for each species in some places um, so that's relatively easy to do now but at a global level it's easy that's why we did it because mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have such good spatial resolution when you get to regional yeah. level we rapidly run out of good data um so we're trying to do that now for europe and china because uh chen Shur has moved moved to china so we're, we're trying to look at it there oh, okay. but even in europe some of the data sets are very biased so we, we'll have to do some clever modeling of species and make sure it's representative but the environmental data helps because if we know the habit, if we know the environmental habitat is different, then it it's kind of supports the idea that the species will be different in those areas as well. Yeah, very interesting. I think that's a very good thing to to tackle and, and try to have the best solution. Mm -hmm. Very inter interesting, Mark. So, yeah. do we have any more questions here? I don't think we have any in YouTube yet. We have a was really interesting, Mark, because we have a lot of questions that just popped up uh, all the Great. all the way. So it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think if we don't have any questions, uh, you have to rest. It's nighttime there, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I'm going for a walk. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, where that that place behind me there. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, then, Mark, thank you very much. Once again, it was really incredible to have you here. Great. It was a really great opportunity for, to hear your talk.
Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real, real honor and nice to be in Rio de Janeiro and back yeah. to Norway in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully we can have your visit one day here. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. A real visit, yeah.